It's my pleasure to introduce Sue Muller, the Genealogy SIG organizer for the computer users of Erie. Sue is a retired educator, yay, and administrator. <laughs> She's a member of the computer users of Erie, and that's in the Pennsylvania side. She has lived in Girard, PA for 48 years and been working seriously on genealogy for more than 25 years and has used Family Tree Maker since 1996, including being a beta tester starting back in 2012. She teaches monthly genealogy classes for the Erie County Library right now by Zoom, hopefully soon back in. Sue is sharing with us the prep work needed to go on a geology, genealogy road trip. She'll show us how to research where your family members are buried and what you should know before you go. Next, what you should take with you to record information you find in cemeteries, and then how to make your list and check in it twice. Lastly, she'll talk about social media and how it's your friend, the benefits of personal contacts before you travel. And I will now turn the presentation over to Sue. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, the genealogy road trip may be a little more challenging during COVID times, but it's certainly still doable, probably more doable than it was last year. Um, and I'm assuming that all of you here are interested in genealogy, so you wanna know about your past. Um, I'm gonna talk about preparing for your trip, how you can develop local contacts, even if you don't have family members there. And I know some of you stay away from social media, but social media can be very helpful in this process. And the libraries are also going to be very helpful and some uh, internet resources that you can use to find out if you wanna visit cemeteries where your relatives are buried. And then some things you might wanna consider due to COVID that will make things um, a little more challenging. Um, not, when I say map it out, decide where you're gonna go and when. Obviously, you're not gonna be visiting the cemeteries uh, 10 o'clock at night. Um, take a copy of your family tree with you because there's only so much you can make hold in your head. Uh, if you have family in the area, you might wanna contact them and let them know you're coming, but you can make new friends that can help you out also. Um, not only look at the website for the places you want to visit, um, but you're going to need to call because people are not very good about updating their websites during COVID and there may be restrictions due to COVID. Let's say you wanted to go to the courthouse. A lot of these smaller courthouses close for lunch and it may be even an hour and a half that they close. So you wanna check those things first before you go. Um, and you may be actually traveling where your phone, you're not gonna be able to access your maps on your phone. So take a screenshot with you um, if you're gonna be in areas with limited cell services. And so you'll have your directions even if you don't have a signal. Um, you, you don't wanna re-research what you already have. So make sure you know what you have and then what you want to know. And also plan, if you may have the best plan in the world and may not be able to access what you had thought you'd be able to see. So have a backup plan for what you want to research secondarily. Um, talk to people on the phone, find out what records they hold. Um, many libraries have a genealogy resource room and they may have researched your family. They may have a drawer with, with family files in it. Um, is there a staff member who's particularly talented in that area? What hours does he or she work? Um, are there requirements for researching? Are you going to be restricted to a time? In other words, only an hour on their local computers or whatever they have. Um, they may have a visitor guide if they're a big place, um, but don't, as I mentioned before, do not believe the website, make a phone call. Um, and even if you're not on social media, this is worth getting on Facebook at least for a limited time. Um, 
the handout includes a, uh, a PDF with all kinds of Facebook sites related to genealogy and his history. Doesn't mean that that's all of them. I would also search locations plus the word genealogy or historical societies because they may not be there. And every time you talk or contact somebody, ask them for advice because they live there. They will have ideas, you know, get some information where people say this was, wasn't worth my time. They charged 10 bucks for me to go for the day and they didn't have what I needed. So, um, and cemetery records particularly, somebody may be keeping those on the computer in their house. It may, they may not, there may not be a cemetery office. In fact, some cemeteries you're gonna find are gonna be on private land and are you gonna be able to access it at all? Um, that PDF that I, that I mentioned being on the handout, um, the gal that did that, the last update was January 2000, or 2021. Um, She's hand passed that on to Cindy's list and it's going to be updated there, but there's been no update since January. So that's the most recent. Uh, and there's also one for uh, Canadian and Australian, um, but I, I'm assuming you're not making road trips there this summer. Um, so get on social media, target pages and groups that are relevant to the area. The library may have a Facebook page. A city, county, regional genealogy, historical societies may just because you find one genealogy society or one historical society doesn't mean you've hit the mother load. Right around me, there's a county one. There's a uh, two, three different ones in the West County area. There's one, two, three different ones in the South County area. So some of them have a regional name. Some of them have a town name. So keep checking, call the library, call the local borough office and get information, ask what, where the records are, are there historical societies, when do they meet, do they have research facilities, all that, some of these backwoods places may not even have web pages, so um, it may be word of mouth that you get your information. Um, start, start with the, the place name. In fact, I've had some luck on a site like, you know, you're from Fairview, Pennsylvania, if that's where I'm researching, because then I can just ask in general for some ideas. And it may not even be people that are interested in genealogy that answer, but they know the information. Also, if you, there may be family groups for your surname. And I found that sometimes people on those groups are not interested at all in genealogy, but they have pictures and they're willing to share the pictures. So uh, knock on as many doors as you can. Uh, there's all kinds of, of uh, Facebook groups. One of them is genealogy translations. Um, people post up, I have something in Polish. I want, want it to be, uh, translated to English, and within a half hour, somebody's translated it for them. I'm looking for an obituary, I'm looking for this. It's incredible what's out there. So if you're not on social media, at least get on temporarily to help you out for your road trip. Uh, and as I mentioned before, with every call, ask who else can I, where else can I look? Who else can I call? Um, do you have contact information? A referral. Sometimes uh, having a name of somebody local will help you with an in. So and so told me to call you. Can you help me out? That kind of thing. Um, it is amazing how much information you can get from local people, whether or not they're interested in genealogy or cemeteries. So, what should you pack? that you might forget. Well, I'm assuming you wouldn't forget to take your chargers and power cords, but I always make a list because I it, it's something important like that that's easy to forget. If you don't always carry a flash drive in your pocket or on your keychain, you need to put one there um, because that will be very helpful. If you have a, you know, your, your phone can take pictures, a lot of your phones will act as a scanner. 
It, I have also have a wand scanner where I can scan something big. Um, our major cemetery association here in Erie County, they're perfectly happy to make copies for you. Unfortunately, their books are so huge that they can't put it on the copier. So they have no objection for you scanning a page if you have a wand scanner or taking a picture with your camera. So you need to be prepared for that. Depending on how old the library is, they may only be able to make copies for you. Their copies are usually re very reasonable, uh, but sometimes the printer is attached right to uh, the microfilm and you have to drop the 10 cents in before you can make the um, copy. So be prepared for that or ask those questions before you go so that you know. Um, a sweater. A lot of archival material are stored under certain temperatures and you might find it a little chilly in there when you're researching. So throw a sweater in even if you're in the middle of summer. Um, you may not be able to use a pen when, depending on the archives that you go into. Some of them do not allow you even into the room with a pen. So uh, make sure you also have pencils. Um, contact lists. Remember, you may not be able to access your phone if you get in the backwoods and printouts of what you want to do. Um, the printout of the hours, fees, if confirmations, if you have a number or you've made an appointment or you have special instructions. Um, a camera, phone, recorder, depending on your level of expertise, you can record, of course, with your, with your camera. Um, I always, I still carry my laptop with me. And as I said, I have one of those wand scanners that I use. Also, I take, if I have things to share, whether they're printed or just digital, take those two. It's a lot easier to get things that have people share with you if you have things to share and take your sense of humor and spirit of adventure because things will go wrong no matter how much you plan. Um, if you're going to a cemetery, I have a little garden kit that I, that, that I, well, I carry it in my car all the time in the summer. And I, I like to have scissors as well as clippers. I have a trowel, a cultivator, a whisk room in there, uh, cotton gloves. The wet wipes are for me, not for the stones. I'm gonna talk about how you can clean a stone and there's only one thing that's any good for it. Um, the wet, your hands are gonna get dirty because it doesn't matter that you have the trowel and the cultivator, you're still gonna get your hands dirty as you're pulling weeds. Uh, why do you want a flashlight? Sometimes that will help you take a picture if you aim the flashlight on the on the stone. Or if you have one of those large mirrors, and there's lots of videos on YouTube on how to do this, you can line one up and you can read a stone. That doesn't seem like you can read it at all. Uh, some cemeteries have maps online. Uh, so I would take a printed map uh, out. It's a lot easier to see a printed map than the little one that's on your phone. Um, you're going to need to write some things down, so I always have pencil and paper, but I'm a little bit old school. Um, if you want to clean a tombstone, do not use shaving cream. The, the only things that are safe for cleaning a tombstone Orvis soap, which is a soap that they sell for cleaning horses, and it comes, I don't know, the last time I bought it, it, it was like an eight-pound container of it, ran around $15. Um, a soft scrub brush, a plastic card like a credit card, because that's great for scraping things off uh, the, that are stuck on the, on the stone. The, um, the, the only solution that would be safe for you to use is D2. It's a biologic solution. Uh, it will work. You spray it on. Uh, it, it's expensive. It runs around $50 a gallon. Uh, you can reduce it 50% and you put it in a spray bottle. 
or, or a pump bottle that you can spray with. And it will work if you just spray it on and walk away. It'll take a while. But if you want to actively clean it, then bring lots of water. Um, a pump dispenser is best. I, have, I bring gallon jugs of water. I don't always know if there's going to be um, water at the cemetery. And then I have a pump dispenser, it must be a gallon, um, that I can pump up and spray when I'm cleaning stones. So, and you can also use a little dental brush to get in the lines like in granite, um, but nothing else on the, on the tombstones. And take the pictures as soon as you can, because I have pictures my mom took in 76 of stones that are fairly clear that I can hardly read today. Uh, the stones, the present stones, I can see her pictures fine, but not, uh, not the stones anymore. And uh, some genealogical societies have a research library. Find out what they have, whether it's gonna be worth your time to go there. And some of them are open, um, not on a regular basis, only a couple days a week. So you want to schedule. Um, that way. They, they may have newspapers on microfilm or those may be located in the, li the local library. It depends. I always ask too whether I'm going to have to, whether I can get the films myself or whether I'm going to have to ask for them. Because if you're going to have to ask for them, it's really a lot better to go prepared with a long list and you know, get five or six rolls at a time. Um, they may also have resources online or for sale and some of the libraries do too. Um, one of our local libraries has a cemetery index, um, Union City Library of all the Union City libraries. Um, our local library has an obituary index some have marriage or divorce indices. Uh, they may have resources for sale. They may have cemetery books. They may have, and there's different information in the cemetery books. The best ones have, are where they've read the cemetery in cemetery order. And the book is printed that way with an index in the back, because that way you can see names of people around uh, where your ancestors are buried. Uh, I would say more likely the books are just in alpha order, but I have one here that has a lot of extra information in addition to um, what, just what's on the stone. So that does vary. They may also have naturalization resources. They may have indexed um, their local naturalization records. So they may have those things for sale that you can get beforehand, or you may have to go there to their facility to purchase it. And it's usually, they usually sell them cheaper for society members, and it may be cheaper to join the society because sometimes they charge for research, it just varies from place to place. Um, but you definitely need to go to the local library. Um, they may have online or in-house subscriptions. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we have a large county library system and they have a subscription to Newsbank. And that Newsbank in subscription includes the Erie, uh, newspaper back to 1884 up to present day. But I have a friend who lives in Virginia and her library also has a newsbank subscription and it does not have the Erie newspaper on it. It has some Virginia papers that ours doesn't. So apparently those, a newsbank and some of the other library subscriptions are tailored to the library itself. So you might want to explore whether you can get like a summer library card um, to avail yourself of some of those things. And I will tell you a, a little hint. Our library system has a, a main branch in downtown Erie. It has one in Girard, which is the town where I live, which is about 20 miles out of town, out of Erie. If you go in and ask at the Erie 
main library, could you get a card and you live in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, they'll say, no. But if you ask out here at our local library, they say, of course, it's you know, $10 a year. It's the same library card. It's good for the whole thing. It gives you access to all the online resources that the Erie County Library has. And they have more things besides, they have subscriptions to more things besides Newsbank. They have Fold3 and some other, other pay subscriptions. It's worth 10 bucks a year, let me tell you. So if you get turned down at a major library, you might want to go to one of the branches where they're happy to take your $10. And at the end of the year, they'll send you a bill for $10 if you want to renew. It. And you can decide what you want to do. Um, they may have newspapers on microfilm. Um, most of the libraries are upgrading their microfilm system and they're tied to a computer, which is the importance of bringing the flash drive because you can save the pages, the obituaries, whatever you find on your flash drive. You don't need to print it. I don't object to paying a dime or a quarter for a copy, but then I have to go home and scan it or type it or whatever. Uh, whereas if I have it digitally, you know, half the thing is done. They may have special local indexes marriages, deaths, um, those kinds of things. They may have um, family files. Uh, if you're searching on any of those online indexes, unless you're using a name like Smith, I would start with the surname only because that's going to give you married names of siblings. It's going to give you siblings you might not have known about or relatives you didn't know about. Uh, so it, it start your search, not just with the name, but of a surname and, and see what you find. Um, wherever you're going, check the library websites and it may be a city library, it may be a county library, it may be a university library. Um, the Penn State University Library has, um, they do have a lot of Pennsylvania newspapers that they've digitized, but they digitized the first thing they did was the Center County newspaper, um, and they started with the in the, with the obituaries first. Um, so your local educational institutions may be very rich sources for uh, resources. Uh, most library websites also have genealogy links, and they may have some that are peculiar to their area, like the historical societies or genealogical societies. And as I mentioned, they may have resources that are just for patents. And if you can purchase a car, it, they're usually very reasonably priced and worth buying. I mentioned before that have a plan and have a backup plan because the best laid plans of mice and men, um, things can go wrong. If check the library catalog before you go, see what they have. Their uh, research volumes will be in the catalog even if they don't circulate. So if you can explore their website first um, and see what's available, but then also call because their hours may have changed. There, there may be restrictions. They may limit your time on a computer. They may have only you know, X number of uh, compute, computers attached to the microfilm. Um, how limited are you gonna be when you go? Always look online first. It, you don't have to see the original document if you can uh, see it digitized online. There are a lot of courthouse records that are online. The trick is that most of them are not indexed. So that means that they're not searchable, but they're browsable. It doesn't mean they're impossible to find. Wills, probate, and guardianship records may have an indexed book. So then you can get the volume number, the page number, and then finding the will is very simple. Uh, 
some naturalization, some land records are online and they're not indexed. Uh, Family Search site has the bulk of these. Uh, they have a commitment to try and digitize everything they have. So they are gradually working on indexing them, but many of them are not indexed. And I'm going to show you how to access those because some people, even though they're familiar with uh, Family Search, they're not familiar with the rich collections that haven't been um, indexed yet. And just let me mention that not all courthouse records are at the courthouse. I was in Center County, Pennsylvania, which is the, the, in the center of the state, which is where Penn State is located. And none of the wills and probate records are at the courthouse. They're at a local historical library, not the regular library system, but it's a historical library in the basement and you can request them. And I actually held my great, great grandfather's will in my hand. Many of those um, copiers that they have now are connected to the internet. All I had to do is put the pages on and scan them and email them to myself. There was no fee uh, for any of the records. Uh, I made a donation when I left, but and ask where the records are because they may not be where you expect them to be. Uh, Family Search is the Church of the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, it's a totally free site. And I will tell you that I have never called them with a question that I haven't gotten somebody that knows the answer. When you talk to somebody there, they know what they're talking about. And if you ask a region specific, that you get somebody that doesn't know the answer, they will call you back with someone who does know or transfer your call to somebody else. So if you have occasion to call them, um, it's, worth a, it's worth a phone call. Um, but that being said, they have a lousy search engine. Don't be too restrictive because you may eliminate records that you want but th that didn't have all that information on. Um, so, you know, start with a, if you're looking for, say, marriage record, start with a, the, the, the bride and the groom's name and just put USA because well, I live in the northwestern corner of Pennsylvania. Some people go to Ohio or to New York State to get married. So there's no guarantee that they were married in Erie County. Um, so I don't want to eliminate what when I don't know for sure but the the website itself has all kinds of browsable resources that you can't search but you can search by location and you can find them um, they have more resources at their family history centers or their family history libraries it's also important to go to one of those well, I'll give you an example. I was looking for, they have a subscription to a, a Swedish site, and I was looking for some Swedish records. And I went in Erie to the Family History Center there, and they didn't know what I was talking about because we do not have a high Swedish population here in Erie County, nor people who have settled there. But in Jamestown, which is like 60 miles away, they have a very high percentage of Swedish there. When I went there and asked the same question, they knew what I was talking about. They could help me use the website and they were very helpful. So location may be important if you're actually going to one of their history centers. But just a quick on how to access the catalog. The default is to search on, on records and you get the screen asking for a name. You don't want to do that. You want to go to the catalog. And so it's a pull down and it'll ask for a location. Uh, and it's a catalog of genealogical materials that includes books, that includes microfilm, microfiche, other publications. Some of them have, are searchable and I'll show you how you can tell whether they are or not. But the, the goal of the Mormons is to increase digital access to all the materials that they have. So when you search, 
do not search by um, city. Just search by the county because if the county, if the city's in the county, you'll get that. You don't want to be too restrictive. So uh, this is a list on the right of the kinds of things that they have and how many uh, books or records they have. Even though you put that you want only online records, you're still going to get it doesn't listen to you when you do the search, but um, it is what it is. It's cumbersome to search, but it, there's rich stuff here, so it's well worth it. Pennsylvania didn't start keeping uh, statewide birth records until 1906, but the counties were told in the late 1800s that they were supposed to keep that record, those records. It doesn't mean that they did, but most counties started in 1892, 1893 to keep those records. They started right away with the marriage records. I don't understand why they didn't do the other ones, but they did. Um, so I'm interested in birth records. So I hit birth records and then you can see they digitized A through K and L through Z. And one of them is actually searchable. See the little magnifying glass down there? That means you can enter a name and search, but that's only through for A through K. They haven't indexed the other one. But that little camera means that you can look at it. Well, you know your alphabet, and it's it's not that hard to look through them. They're they're grouped by the first letter of the surname, and then the first letter of the first name. So, and then they're in chronological air, order. So it's not easy if you wanted to see all the Joneses that were born in that time period because you'd have to go through the entire alphabet. But if you knew your guy was named Anthony Jones, it would be not, and about when he was born, it would be nothing to roll through all the A's and then they're in chronological order. So once you start using this, it, it, it really goes fairly quickly and, and there's a rich amount of material. And it saves you from a courthouse visit. As far as cemeteries, some of your larger cemeteries or sometimes your Catholic cemeteries may have a grouping. They may have an online database and in which case they may have a map and they may be, the map may clearly define the sections. In fact, um, the database that the Erie County uh, or the Erie Library, I'm sorry, the Erie Cemetery Association has has a map that includes the names of the uh, grave sites around the person you're looking for. So this is kind of nice if you go to a place where there is no stone, you can verify that there is no stone if you have the names around it and you walk around and you don't find it. Let me warn you too though, sometimes if you're looking for Betty uh, Anderson, it, the tombstones may say Elizabeth. So I, when I get there and I just start taking pictures of all the Andersons and then I circle around for a bigger circle to get it. And sometimes I think, oh, my, you know, I was looking for Betty and she's not there. And when I go home and I look through my pictures, there was Elizabeth and of course, it was Betty. So it may be a nickname on the tombstone. It may not be the exact name you're looking for. Uh, but check to see if the cemetery itself has something online that you can access. There are uh, online cemetery websites. Find a Grave has 190 million uh, entries. Billion Graves, they're, they're, they don't want to tell you how many they have. They have about half the number that... Um, Find a Grave has, Billion Graves is run by the um, Church of the Latter-day Saints, and they're trying to get the numbers up. They have a free, free uh, program you can access, or they have a subscription one. And to encourage people to take more pictures, their rewards, if you take X number of pictures, they give you a month free of uh, subscribing to the site um they are they claim that everything is um 
has a GPS location on it, but when they first started, they didn't have GPS on there, so there are not, not all of their uh, grave sites have GPS locations on them. There's also a, an older site, probably only has about 25 million um, entries called internment.net, but that often has transcriptions of cemeteries. It may not be a full transcription. It may be somebody that went in and they were interested in the McDonald family and they just took picture or took transcriptions for the McDonald's, but it'd be something from that cemetery. Um, see if they, you can purchase a cemetery book or a CD and um, that might help you with your research too. Know before you go. This is a perfect example of why you should do that. I see this stone, Francis Leon, and some dates. Well, that sounds like that was her name, right? It's Francis with an E, so it was a female. And this is the setting for where the stone is. But her last name was Bartholomew. So if I didn't know that beforehand, I might not find what I was looking for. It was not uncommon in the early, early 1900s, probably into the 30s, to have a great big family stone and then have the family around with the flat stones. So they often would put like Mother Jane on the stone and no surname. But because they used Francis's middle name and her first name, it looks like a first name and a last name. So the advantage, of course, of having done your research beforehand is you, you come to the table knowing something. Um, so I recommend when you when you're taking cemetery pictures, that every time you go into a new cemetery, you take a picture of the entranceway. That way you're not gonna get too confused when you go home about who was in what cemetery. But here's what happens. Many times two cemeteries are right up next to each other. It's not uncommon that one would be a Catholic cemetery and one a, uh, a uh, either the Protestant cemetery or another uh, another uh, uh, organization like that. So you may not know which cemetery you're in. And I found this frequently, uh, especially if you're in the back of the cemetery and you keep walking and suddenly you're out of the Protestant cemetery and you're in the Catholic cemetery. So that's why you will find things on find a grave where they actually have people in the wrong cemetery because they've been out wandering around um, and they didn't realize that they went into a different cemetery. There's no sign, there's no gate, there's no fence. Uh, it's very confusing. And then sometimes the cemeteries have names that are really close to each other. One's a Lutheran Reformed and one's a Lutheran. So um, it, it's easy to make a mistake. Always when you find an ancestor or somebody's picture that you want to take a picture of their stone, take pictures all around because it may you know, there may be different surnames, maybe married daughters um, or married sisters. So you, um, you, you won't know till you get all your pictures at home what, what you have. So take more than you think you need with, you know, with a digital camera. It's easy and not worrying about film. Um, take a flashlight because you can set the flashlight so you can see the letters on things that stick out where you can't see. If you've got room in your car for one of those big mirrors, you, you, that, that will be very helpful. Um, pay attention to where the sun is when you take your picture because you could have yourself as a big shadow across the screen and a high gloss stone can you can see someone taking a picture of the tombstone there. When you have a high gloss stone, you may find yourself front and center on the stone and you may not want that. So um, look at your pictures or pay attention to 
the ones that are shiny can create problems for you. Um, I'm going to show you my great great grandfather's tombstone. So you would think that at least one thing that would be correct on there would be the date of death, right? I would think so. At least I hope that my ancestors didn't pay a lot of money for that stone because he died January 3rd, 1907. Or he died, I'm sorry, 1908. Now, my mother had the obituary for me and she had cut it out of a newspaper and trimmed it up very nicely and wrote January on it. I can't tell you how long I looked for his death certificate or to find the reference for his the tombs to, for his death the death certificate when Pennsylvania released those. The problem was, of course, that he died in 1908, and it did take me a while to figure that out. His wife. Um, was buried in an unmarked grave in Center County. And she, it was after her that I was named. So I ultimately replaced the stone with the right dates on it uh, and with a note on find a grave that uh, Susanna is not actually there, that she's in an unmarked grave in Center County because she's, you see, she predeceased him by a lot and he relocated to Clinton County. So there's a, there are a lot of pictures and a lot of entries on find a grave and that there may be errors. It's largely correct. If you become a member, which is totally free, by the way, Ancestry now owns find a grave, but I don't think they have any plans of um, making it a, a pay site. But then if you become a member, you can make corrections. You can sponsor memorials for $5. They'll take all the ads off of it. Uh, so it's an incredible resource. One nice thing is, let's say that Aunt Emma died out in Wyoming, and you'll probably never get there to Wyoming. You can um, ask a volunteer to take a picture for you, and some nice volunteer will eventually get around to it. So uh, it is a, uh, a, a great resource. I will, and people take a leap of faith on find a grave. I was searching for a cousin and I had, she was married um, a second time and her first husband's name was Shropshire and the second one was Mitchell. And this was down in Georgia and I was on the find a grave and I found one woman who had some memorials of Shropshire and Mitchell and I sent her a note and I said, I know this is a long shot, but you know, I was looking for my cousin. Uh, and she was my cousin's best friend. I mean, I know that that's a long shot, but it worked. I had somebody contact me on that Hickoff name because I have a lot of Hickoff memorials and I have pictures on a lot of the memorials, pictures of, of family rather than in addition to tombstones to say she was doing, it was her father's 80th birthday coming up and she was looking for genealogical information. And of course she hit the mother load when she contacted me. So sometimes just take a leap of faith. The, the worst that can happen to somebody say, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. I'm not interested. Uh, you may get the birth and death dates. You may get places of birth and death. You may get links to parents, siblings, spouse, pictures of the tombstone, death certificate, obituaries. It may have a GPS on it. It may hardly have anything on it. So, you know, it's a crapshoot of what you're going to get, but it's a terrific site and a good way to connect with other people. Um, I mentioned how Billion Graves says that they have GPS for everybody, but they don't. It's primarily headstone images and they have added social security information. And by the way, the social security death index has only been released up through February of 2014. By law, it can be released three years after the date of death, but they've only sold through um, February, 2014. Um, 
I mentioned that it was free and that they do have a subscription services and they do have incentives to try and get you to use the app. I, I, I only use it once in a while to look for a picture. So I'm not, I, I put pictures on find a grade, but not on that one. Um, inter, interment.net is primarily transcriptions, but sometimes pictures, it, it's usually done by a local um, and they, they usually county sites. So I recommend you know, doing a, a Google search, like a county, a place name, plus cemetery transcriptions to see what you get. If you're looking for recent um, deaths, legacy.com is probably the best place for that. And that's a totally free site. Um, that's what it looks like. You don't want to do a straight search without going to more options because the, the default for a search is just deaths in the last week. So you can do a pull down and do all if you have no idea or you can restrict it to when the, the date is. They used to have social security death index tied to it, but they um, eliminated that. And our newspaper, the, the Erie... Um, Times News has discontinued its relationship with this site. Uh, so I'm not sure what happened. I'm sure there's a fee. It's a cooperative venture of newspapers and funeral homes. And on the older obituaries, they reduce the size of the obituary. But the thing that they always include is the name of the funeral home. So uh, most funeral homes, if they ever post an obituary online, they don't take it down or you can call them and ask. And they're very helpful. They can tell you more about the cemeteries, you know, when cemeteries change names or if the uh, cemeteries have been relocated, the funeral homes generally are a good source of that. And I found them to be very helpful when I called. Um, so uh, obituaries can be found on funeral homes, newspapers, library sites, and you know, do a Google search with the name plus obituary. Um, not everybody who's doing family tree is doing it on a family tree site like Ancestry or, or um, Family Search. They may just have a, a family website themselves. So it's always good to use a, a Google search and see um, where you're going. It's in newspaper sites there, they're all included on the handout. The reason I mentioned Chronicling America is they list all the newspapers that were ever published and when you can, um, or where they're, they're located. So that can be helpful to find out. Sometimes it's a local university rather than the um, library that has papers for you. Um, cemeteries can be on private land. That's something you need to know beforehand. Church offices are not usually too helpful because they've got the files in boxes and they can't find them. Um, so you need to find out those information or that information before you travel, where the records are. Uh, once you have a GPS for the cemetery, they don't, they don't usually have a street address, but there are a number of uh, websites where you can just punch in a GPS location and it'll give you a street address so that you can make your GPS go there. Um, I put one of them on the handout, but there's none is better than the other. Um, so some other places you might want to look, which are listed on the handout. Um, Cindy's list is like a great big library. She, when she first started, she only had uh, connections to or links to um, free sites, but she's gotten some subscription sites on there too, but it's a tremendous resource. And she wants to know if, if a website is, or her links aren't active. So she keeps that up to date. This is a little known, uh, but a really great resource, totally free. Just remember to stick the word the in front of it because there's another site called the Ancestor called Ancestor Hunt, which not, is not nearly as good. Um, archive.org 
has uh, out of copyright materials, including the history books, biography books that were so popular at the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s, and some family history books. But they also have a lending library where they'll lend you a PDF that goes poof when your time is up. So don't think that you can hide it on your computer. Um, I mentioned creative searching before, but um, there's all kinds of ways you can use Mr. Google to help you out. If you use quotes, you only get what's in the quotes and don't be frightened. Uh, so if you quote, look for Sue Muller and the reference was Susan Muller and you had it in quotes, you'd only get the Sue. Whereas if you put Sue Muller, no quotes, then you'll get Susan, Susanna, S Muller, you know, all those things. The first, because they want to get paid, the first things will be ads. I know Google labels them. I'm not sure about all the other search engines, but that doesn't mean they're not a good resource when you're doing the search. Um, so things that you might want to consider for COVID, I know I've said this before, but I can't say it too many times, the websites may not be up to date. You need to call close to your time trip because things can even change if you call today and you're tra traveling till October. Is there an appointment necessary for research? Are you gonna be restricted by time? It, is some, can somebody help you? Is there a, a, a person who works there who knows more than other people? Um, those kinds of things you need to give some thought to.